there and welcome to Hardman Talks. I'm Caroline Hegney from Hardman & Co. And today I'm speaking to James Alexander, the CEO of UXIF. Um, I guess I'd term that the organization at the forefront um, of ESG standards in finance and investment. Uh, today, James is going to talk about the key drivers between the huge momentum in ESG in the investment sector, um, mass investor appetite for ESG funds, the emphasis that's broadened out from climate over the last two years. Um, I guess touching on one or two examples of fund uh, management uh, activism, if you like, um, to bring about change in behavior of companies. Um, and James is a particular advocate of engagement rather than divestment, um, which I, I completely agree with. Um, and he's going to take us through that. Um, possibly touching on the increased regulatory pressure driving change. Um, and um, I guess we start from there. James, it's great to welcome you to Hardman Talks. How are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you, Caroline. It's great to be here. And uh, yeah, it feels like, like you know, the new year is well in place. Spring is, spring is starting to arrive. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and we're, we're, it feels like we're kind of in the exit period of the pandemic as well. So everything's moving in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess it's, perhaps you can introduce yourself um, and introduce to our audience absolutely very happy to and uh and and uh you know so i'm james alexander i'm chief executive uh, we, we call it uk sif these days so uh, we 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 slightly rebranded by means of saying it differently um but uh but yeah i'm chief executive of uk sif which is the uk sustainable investment and finance association so we are the i suppose membership network for sustainable finance across the uk we bring together um everybody from and, and you know companies from across the uh the, the sustainable finance world um and actually mainstream financial services firms as well and we've got now nearly 300 members um representing more than 10 trillion pounds of assets under management so we, we we really do represent the mainstream of uk financial services um and, and looking to drive forward sustainability in financial services uh, and that's not just from a climate change perspective that's from a full broad esg perspective um, and so it's really exciting what we're doing and i think now is a really really key moment in the progression of the sustainable finance agenda Okay, and, and why would you say now is a, a, a key moment? Well, I think I think we're in this really amazing period where where you know the old adage of financial services of you know kind of we invest in the economy as we find it. It's not our job to to have a view or a role in shaping or changing that economy. You know, I think that's of the past, and I think now what we're seeing is the financial services firms, um, certainly in the UK, but I think globally as well, are starting to say, well, actually, we do have. Uh, a role in shaping the world as we see it, in shaping the economy, in shaping the direction of travel that we move into. Um, we do also recognise that we see huge challenges, um, whether it's climate change, whether it's um, deforestation and nature loss, whether it's you know things like modern day slavery. You know, we we are seeing these huge challenges, and actually, as an industry, thinking about well, what can we do to make change on those challenges? How can we address those things? What levers can we pull? whether they're big levers or small levers, um, to make a difference and to, and, to, and to play a role. And I think that's a really fundamental change. And I think that momentum stems from the firms themselves, um, whether it's at the top leadership level, whether it's the, the kind of new intake of, uh, of young people that, that for whom you know, caring about the world around us is just part of their, their worldview and way of working. Um, and of course, whether it's about the wider society that we live in, where customers are now increasingly interested in sustainability and thinking about where their money goes, whether it's their pension or whether it's their, their investments or their savings. Um, and then, of course, you've got government and regulators that, are, that have got this at the core of what they're doing as well. We saw the, um, the government has passed legislation that the UK will, will reach net zero by 2050, that will in, um, lower emissions by 78% by 2035. I mean, that is a tough target to reach. Um, uh, but that's now what's in, in law in the UK. We've seen you know, a big international agreement, not least of which most recently COP26, which really did drive momentum. And actually, just as an aside, the COP26 was an amazing place to be because I think in the past you've had the private sector go to big climate conferences around the world and start to sort of go there with the view of 
lobbying for things to go slower, for less momentum, for less progress. And actually at COP, we saw this, this COP round in, in Glasgow, we saw a big change. I think, you know, we were there as part of this chorus of industry, of banks, of private sector participants saying, we want governments of the world to go further, to go faster, to move, the, to move this agenda on. And almost maybe the, gov the, the private sector overtook where the governments are at when you look at the net zero commitments that were being made by, by corporates and by investors um, across the world. So, you know, we are in this amazing period of momentum, particularly on climate change uh, or tackling climate change. But that is flowing through to then to looking at, you know, solving other challenges as well. Um, but I think also on the other side of it, though, we recognize and we, you know, it is not in our gift to solve all of these problems on our own. You know, as an industry, we can go, we can push hard and we are pushing hard in many areas. Um, but, uh, but, you know, everybody has to play their part in solving these challenges. Governments need to go, go further. Um, uh, individuals, all of us as individuals need, to, need to, to make the changes that we need to make in our lives as well. But we want to play our part. And I think that's been the really big driver of momentum here. Okay, and you certainly sound passionate about your role in driving about change. Um, I mean, touching on climate change, I guess what um, strikes me uh, has been the broadening out from, from the focus on environmental and climate to uh, a lot more focus on the other two aspects of ESG, the social and the governance. Um, and I'm... I really I'm kind of thinking about over the past two years um, over the pandemic the the social aspects of working from home uh, the social aspects of those people who were delivering um, goods etc to our homes then governance um, and much more of a drive to uh, board diversity I think that, that these topics have really, really um, mushroomed, if you like. Absolutely. And I think, I think again, part of the exciting thing that's happened is, the, is yeah. the changing role of investors in considering what they can do about these things and thinking about the role that they can play. And so you're, you're, you're completely right. Um, you know, the, this full ESG focus has just has just ballooned and expanded as, as an industry um, in, a, in a really positive way because it's having a positive impact on the world around us. And I think that's that's one of the key philosophical changes that's happening, which is that, that historically in the past, ESG and sustainability has been considered from risk lens. You know, what is the risk to my company, to my investments from these things happening? And now it's about saying, well, risk is obviously important, and that's a key part of what we do. It's also looking at impacts and thinking about, and think, actually, what is, what is the impact I'm having on the world by making these investments or by running my company in this way? Now, that impact can be positive or negative. And it's about thinking about, well, what is the wider range of impacts on the full breadth of ESG issues? So obviously that includes climate change, but under the E of ESG, we're starting to see much more focus on you know, wider environmental issues. And we're starting to think about this in the context of planetary boundaries. You know, what can the earth sustain um, in terms of human activity? Now, whether that is uh, soil degradation, um, whether it is water pollution or air pollution, whether it's uh, deforestation and species loss, you know, there's a whole load of planetary boundaries that we are pushing right up against um, and in danger of, of, of going right over the top of. Um, of. Of course, the most, you know, one of the most well-known and most pressing of those is, is, is greenhouse gas emissions and, and the, you know, the, the impact that's going to have on, on global climate and already is having on global climate. And then, of course, you're right, they're, they're, they're looking into the wider social issues. Um, we're thinking about as you said, um, diversity and inclusion was huge topics. Of course, the Black Lives Matter movement um, that we saw over the pandemic had a huge influence on, on, on that and, and people's thinking around that. Um, also looking at things like modern day slavery and forced labor. Um, we're looking at things uh, like um, workers' rights. Um, and you know, the, the recent PO ferry scandal shows us that, that workers' rights are still right at the heart, the you know, front and center of uh, uh, of this conversation. And you know, you mentioned how we get things delivered and, and how things are you know transported to our homes. We've seen a huge surge in you know Deliveroo and Uber and 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 other you know deliveries, Amazon and other delivery services during the pandemic, one of the questions that sustainable investors are asking themselves is, is this actually a sustainable investment? And when you think about, well, what, what is the meaning of a sustainable investment is looking at, well, can this keep going in the way that it's going without having negative impacts on society and the world in, and, you know, indefinitely? And, and, and fundamentally, there's a, a really big question to ask about 
does this extremely low wage gig economy model, um, can that go on indefinitely? What are the risks to that model? Um, whether it's you know societal risks uh, from in terms of changing attitudes, is it legal risks in terms of changing rights of of, of these um, uh, gig economy workers as as employees? You know, there's a whole range of questions. And for, I think for those sorts of reasons, we saw actually quite a lot of investors stepping away from the Deliveroo IPO, which um, which happened a few months ago. Um, on you know on the basis that they don't think it's a business that's got long-term sustainability in its current model and those things are really interesting and start to highlight um the range of things that investors are looking at when they're considering sustainability yeah so another another um example that uh, springs to mind is the fast fashion industry yeah. um, which is obviously uh, it had enormous success over the last five ten years and um, and obviously online sales over the, the course of the pandemic. Yet you've got previous darlings of the stock market, such as Boohoo, um, wallowing really um, under the weight of uh, the spotlight that's been, been shone upon the, the shoddy work conditions. Um, and as you say, investors beginning to question how sustainable that is going forward. Oh, exactly. You know, Boohoo being caught having fundamentally a modern day slavery factory in, in the UK, in this country as well. You know, I think and I think that's that's what's so scary is that, that for a lot of investors that have been a, doing a huge amount of engagement with Boohoo on their working conditions and on their and on their approaches to how they make their clothes. And um, we're, we're actually taken a bit off guard by this. And and and. You know, I think that's that's why it's so important that we're doing due diligence on these whole range of sustainability issues because you know the impact that they have can be enormous. Um, and and you know, you know, bringing the the, the Russia Ukraine um, conflict into this as well. You know, huge yeah. num huge number of uh, of investors and, and companies like BP and Shell have lost billions and billions of pounds because their investments in Russia are now fundamentally worthless and they've, they've, they've basically been forced to pull out of these of these these joint projects in Russia. Now, if you ask a lot of sustainable investors, um, you know, what have you been advising BP and Shell to do? They'll say, we have been pushing for years for these companies to explain what the what the point of them being in Russia is. It's a country that in 2014 annexed Crimea, um, and yet still these companies continued working on, continued do, with these joint projects. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we get to the point where they, you know, just ruthlessly invade the Ukraine. And, uh, and suddenly then the music stops and those countries, you know, take billion, billion, billions and billions of dollars balance sheet hits, you know, what what is what is you know we have to start looking at what what is that for why were they in that risky position in the first place and and as investors are we looking at this risk this geopolitical risk amongst the other sort of ESG factors we should be considering i think that the uh, the oil and commodity sector is a very difficult one to um to kind of extricate yourself as a company from areas with geopolitical risk um Unfortunately, where the commodities are in the world, and uh, that tends to be the areas which do have higher geopolitical risk, and it, it's a, a risk assessment. And I, I guess there is um, there is also the throwback um, that, by for instance, and this will come on to our, to our um, next area um, by divesting, um, then they are giving away value to those who have less scruples. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is what we saw in Russia um, at the drop of the, the fall of communism. Um, so it was uh, taking the, the commodities of those buying up um, those commodities uh, absolutely drastically reduced prices because people were divesting so it's a difficult one um i think you know that there are it's it's an area um that, that's not easy um but perhaps we can touch on your um on your view as to what the fund management industry does what investors do in terms of changing the behavior of companies that they disagree with. And, you know, we can use the commodities sector, we can use fast fashion. Um, and, you know, 
do, do they just sell them off um, or, you know, is there a better way forward? It's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. I think, it, it, you know, it links to what you mentioned at the beginning, which is our views on divestment versus engagement. And I think we are at this point in the, in the game, particularly when it comes to climate change, um, you know, we are we are so far in now that if you are selling, if you if you own stocks in a, in a company that is not contributing to our net zero future, um, but that could, um, you know, I think, you know, you've got to think very seriously as an investor about how you're going to make change in that company and in the things that you hold and, and using your voice as an investor to, to, to engage actively. Now, one of the one of the amazing levers that we have that's quite unique to 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 the financial service industry is. Fundamentally, we own everything. We own, we, you know, we own all the, you know, many of the shares and stocks that are, that are out there. Which means that collectively, we can vote on AGMs. We can engage with company managements. We can, you know, we can seek change in the companies that we're invested in, um, uh, because you know we we are in that position as 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 the shareholders or the voting, having the voting rights. Um, and so, not only can we engage with company management, but we can follow that through with with votes at the uh, at the AGMs on reports and remuneration and various other things. And so, I think that puts us in a really strong position to be further shaping the world that we want to see. Now, the reason why this is important is because at least 95% of the real economy that we have right now is not aligned to the net zero future that we that we need to see at this moment in time. And so that means that if we are just saying, well, we're going to sell out of these, these unaligned things and only buy the, uh, the green or sustainable companies, well, one, we restrict our investment universe absolutely enormously, and we risk the creation of green asset bubbles, which we don't want to see. Just yeah. to be very clear, we don't think that there is a green asset bubble at the moment, but we think there could be. Um, and But the second thing we, we do is fundamentally, we don't stop those things from happening. We just give past ownership and, and, and the ability to control those things to somebody else, and likely it's to somebody else that cares less than we do at this stage in the game. So our big, one of our big concerns is that, is that you know, all these big polluting companies that really need to be engaged, that need to change what they do, that need active shareholders, that are going to hold the management to account for their sustainability credentials, um, are going to, going to potentially pass over to private equity firms or sovereign wealth funds uh, or other people that are not necessarily going to have as much interest in shaping these companies in the way that we want to see that happen. So we think much better to hold on to these firms and um, to engage actively with company management to be really you know, going full on and sort of, well, first of all, explaining what you want to see, explaining how you think the company needs to get there, expecting to see impact, tying all of that to to um, executive remuneration and to board uh, appointments um, and, uh, and, and kind of making sure and following that, those companies and making sure that they're all doing what they should be doing. And not just with big companies, incidentally, this needs to go through the whole the whole value chain, the whole portfolio. Um, and so and so that's that's why we think it's so important to engage with companies um, now. Of course, there may come a point where you work, you know, to your blue in the face and you work collaboratively with other investors um, and still yet nothing happens. Now, at that point, you may decide that the risk of that company being in your portfolio is so great because it's not meeting the needs of the, of the world of the future that you think, well, maybe that's no longer worth being part of my portfolio. But I think that doing that and trying that engagement is really important. The other thing that we're actually quite worried about, though, is... You know, say, take the scenario is, is, is whether you lower divestment just down a level further. So take the scenario where you have been, say, actively engaging with Shell um, for a long period of time, and they turn around to you and say, you know what, James, great news. Thank you for engaging with us over all these years. We've taken on board what you've said, um, and we're gonna we're gonna become a green energy company. Uh, and so there's two ways that Shell can do that. One is that they can that they can shut down all of their, their existing oil and gas fields, um, presumably take a huge balance sheet hit. Um, uh, but you know they they're doing you know in inverted commas the right thing uh, and becoming the greener energy company that we've been asking for. As an investor, that's not aligned with my interest because a company taking a huge balance sheet hit is not necessarily something I'm going to be supportive of. So the likely course of action is that the company will say. We've done what you've wanted to say, uh, what you want us to do. We're going to sell our oil fields and we're going to use the proceeds of that to invest in wind turbines and solar panels. So what's happened then? Well, the exact thing that we wanted to avoid happening at the top level, i.e. selling the shares of Shell, has happened one layer down, which is that the, the, the assets, the polluting assets, will still end up probably in the hands of private equity or sovereign wealth funds or people that don't care about it as much as we do. So how what we've got to do, and I don't have answers for this right now, but what we've got to do is think about how do we get companies to stop 
um, their, their polluting activity in a responsible way um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and to, to transition in a responsible way. And of course, that doesn't just mean about what happens to the assets. It also means what happens to the people and the jobs and the communities that are going to be potentially hugely affected by this transition to net zero. Um, and that whole concept of a just transition, making sure that the transition um, takes people with it um, that, that, that doesn't leave communities behind. That's also really important too. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, perhaps you can talk about um, regulatory drivers um, driving change. Absolutely. I think you, you mentioned at the start about COP22 uh, and governments really overtaking um, private and uh, public companies and um, banks, et cetera, in terms of their drive to net zero. Yeah, so, so regulation, I think, is going to perform a huge part of the puzzle here. Um, and, well, and, you know, and, and, and you might be surprised to hear an organization like us who's got members across the financial services industry calling for more regulation, but that is actually what we're doing. Uh, and the reason why um, is, is, is primarily because at the moment we're seeing a lot of greenwash in the industry. We're seeing you know, a lot of our financial advisor members, for example, come to us and say, and say James, there's a real problem that our clients are now saying they want to invest their funds in line with their values, which, of course, is something we would support. Um, the challenge is the financial advisors are finding it quite hard to discern and determine which of the products available on the market that claim to have sustainability credentials are actually genuinely really trying to push things forward at the pace and scale of the changes that we need to make versus those that have got a really good job done by the marketing department to put together a nice brochure. There is a fundamental problem that currently you can do both, and that harms the leaders. That harms the people that are doing the most work, that are going, you know, going the full yeah. mile um, and really pushing things forward because you know they've got the costs, they've got to have you know the teams that are looking at this, they've got to have the way of working on this. And um, other people can just pretend that they're doing it and get away with it. So we're quite in favor of new regulations that, that will that will make it much harder to greenwash uh, and to, to blag your way into sustainability and pretending that you're sustainable. So um, as part of that, we're part of a group um, with the FCA called the DLAG, the Disclosures and Labels Advisory Group. Um, and we're part of a treasury group called the GTAG, the Green Technical Advisory Group for the Green Taxonomy. Um, and those groups between them are, are creating the UK's disclosure framework um, called SDR, um, which is the UK response, I suppose, to SFDR in, in the EU. Um, it's creating the UK's fund labeling system, which is really important. And it's creating the UK's green taxonomy, which is our list of things or, or investments or, 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 or uh, assets that are, that are regarded as green. And um, in particular, really importantly, is the fund labeling framework. And so it's going to start thinking about, you know, putting criteria around how and when you can describe your fund as sustainable, the sorts of things that you need to do, whether that is, as we've just talked about, being an active engage, uh, an active owner engaging actively with the companies that you hold, um, whether it is uh, um, uh, being uh, investing in sustainable solutions, whether it's investing in impact solutions, you know these are these are the sorts of things that we're looking to see in regulation, and and there will be this this kind of divide, I suppose, between those funds that are that are claiming to have some sustainability credentials, i.e., they are seeking change in the real world, yeah. and those and those that aren't, and I think that's where we're moving towards, and um, and I think that's going to be a really positive and exciting development, and it should really help to. To, to hone the understanding of those people, particularly retail investors, but also you know pension funds and other big investors, institutional investors, on what you know what the challenges are um, and what the funds are available and what they're doing and, and whether they're actually doing what they're saying they're doing. Absolutely, um, and I think that you've touched on, and maybe we'll just finish off with um, the huge increase in ESG funds available. Um, to investors and and I guess how they differentiate there. Yeah, the, I mean, I guess there are there are a, a number of different approaches that one can take yeah. to to ESG funds, whether it's to exclude certain categories. And you know, for for a very long time, there have been funds available that have excluded gambling, uh, for example, or weapons manufacturer. Um, and you know, the that, taking those exclusions further, um, you can have best in class. So those that are that are in different criteria or in different category, industry categories, but are doing doing the most, and um, through to impact funds, which are funds that are perhaps not having, you know, or not looking purely at returns, but looking at almost social returns or societal yeah. returns. 
um, you know, there's a, a really wide range of different funds that are, and types of funds that are available. And that's actually one of the challenges for creating a, a, a labeling, a fund labeling framework is how do you bring together this vast range of complex and, um, and different um, fund structures and styles into a kind of overarching label that's not so complicated that nobody can understand what it means. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different parameters to be looked at here. Um, uh, and of course, there's a lot of stuff happening internationally as well. So we're seeing the creation of the International Sustainability Standards Board, um, which is gonna um, try and create this kind of broad baseline that lots of countries can buy into around how um, uh, sustainability is, is 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 measured and discussed. Um, there's gonna that's gonna also incorporate TCFD, which is climate risk profiling uh, and disclosure. That's um, uh, eventually gonna incorporate TNFD, which is nature risk disclosure. And um, you know, there's there's so many different initiatives happening. And I think what we need to make sure is that they all join up, that they all line up together, but also that each individual country doesn't diverge dramatically from what's happening elsewhere. I think. In, in, in the near term, I think, unfortunately, we're going to see more divergence until at some point we all start to realize how much madness is happening and we start to bring it all back together. And maybe that's where one of the next uh, international climate conferences needs to needs to have a whole um, you know, section dedicated to, to, uh, to bringing back together um, the, uh, the different regulatory and uh, disclosure frameworks that we're developing. OK, well, thank you very much for your thoughts, James. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed listening to James explain the drivers between behind ESG. Uh, any interest um, in finding out more, please head over to have a look at the Buxif website. And to our viewers, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Um, and thank you for listening to us. Thank you again, James. Thank you very much, Caroline. Great to be here. <laughs>